This morning together, I was buried.
picture he told us to use. This is the picture he told us not to use. That's his uh, self-proclaimed rapping picture. Um, we thought a great way to get him initiated into Westbridge would be to have him throw a back-to-school bash three days after he started and invite all of the middle school and high school students. So 90 of your kids showed up uh, Wednesday and a miracle happened. Nobody broke anything. Nobody got stitches. Everybody had fun. Uh, and it was a great win for us. So uh, before you guys take a seat, are there any parents out there who are happy for Tuesday when their kids go back to school? There's a lot of homeschool parents in the first service. They were not very excited. Go ahead and have a seat, guys. On your way in this morning, you should have received a connection card that looked like this. Or sorry, I outlined that looked like this. Um, you can follow along with today's talk, and also, if you want, if you have a smartphone, you can... And you can follow along with our outline there. Inside, you'll also find a giving card. You can uh, drop that in the back of the auditorium if you would like to give this week. Uh, also, drop it in the mail, postage paid anytime. Last is a connection card, and that's for you first-time guests. If you're a first time guest, please fill out as much information as you feel comfortable with. And we have a small gift for you out in the lobby at our uh, first time guest table. So feel free to stop by and grab that. Uh, again, we are so glad you're here. Thanks so much for joining us and have a good rest of the service. Welcome everyone to Westbridge. My name is John and I'm a part of our creative team. I wanna bring your attention to a few things that are happening right here at Westbridge. Groups kick off in just a few weeks, and we believe that life is done best with others in community. We're looking for more people that want to lead or host groups. If you're interested in leading or hosting a group this fall, just check groups on the back of your connection card, and we'll be in contact with you this week. Next Sunday, September 8th, we'll be adding a third Sunday morning service. We've always said that the building is just a tool that we can use to help more people find Jesus. And in order to keep growing and reaching more people, we are expanding Sunday mornings to three services. We'll be having services at 8.30 a.m., 10 a.m., and 11.30 a.m. We still need more people to jump into serving teams to make these three services possible. So we need people brewing coffee, welcoming people, leading kids and students, and keeping people safe. Check out the display in the lobby to see where you can get plugged into in a team. Thank you for helping people find and follow Jesus. Now, also happening next Sunday, we're kicking off our marriage series. This is a great series to invite a friend to join you. Invite them to one of our three Sunday morning services at 8.30, 10, or 11.30 a.m. As we move to the next part of our service, we want you to know that at Westbridge, we are intentional about creating welcoming environments for everyone. So no matter what your relationship with God is or isn't, we are so glad you're here. Enjoy the service. Hey, thank you so much for joining us online. 
This is a great option if you are um, at the cabin or on vacation or maybe you're just someone who lives out of town and participates and engages with us from a distance. Uh, so awesome to have you checking us out through this venue. And uh, we're really excited to be in this series called Vision 2019. It's just where are we heading as a church? Where has God brought us? And where are we moving into the future? And so uh, during this series, we're really going to talk about the vision God has for Westbridge Church. And I'm excited for you to participate with us. Yes, it'll be an amazing series. And we would actually love to have you join us in person here. We have our new building located right here in St. Michael off of Frankfurt Parkway. We have great kids programs. You can grab a hot cup of coffee and come and join us in person. We'd love to have you. Enjoy the service. Hey, good morning. My name is Jeremiah. I'm one of the pastors here at Westbridge. Awesome to have you with us. And uh, man, life would be so easy if it wasn't for people, right? Oh man, that really complicates things. Uh, we are in the, the final week of this series uh, that we've called Vision. And the reason behind this series, and I'd encourage you, if you missed any of the last couple of weeks, uh, go back and check those out. And um, Vision is unique because our mission never changes, but during different seasons of the church, the vision shifts and we focus on new things as we continue to grow and, and uh, God continues to shape us as a faith community. And so uh, week one of this series, we talked about uh, PHPFAFJ, people helping people find and follow Jesus. And so uh, to do that really well, we need to continue to create more opportunities for people. So we're adding a third service next week. You've heard that. And we asked a whole bunch of you to sign up to serve. We asked a whole bunch of you to say, would you join a serving team? And so many of you did that. And we still have a bunch more slots to fill. So I'd encourage you to check that out in the lobby. And then last week, uh, we said, we want to be a church that makes a difference. That we don't just want to make a point. We want to make a difference. And not just here in our community. We want to make a difference around the world and for generations to come. And so we said over the next 12 months, we're going to be launching a brand new thing that's going to help us do more for missions around the world and for future generations than we've ever done in the past. And so I'm super excited about that side of things. And then today, I want to talk to you about roller skating. Yeah, I know you saw it coming. You're like, he's probably going to talk about roller skating. Uh, over the last couple of years, uh, we have, my wife has been saying, I would love to go roller skating. And I'm like, roller skating? I did that when I was eight. Oh, I, like every second grade and first grade birthday party with me and all my friends was like, let's go to the roller rink, right? And I even remember as, uh, as a teenager, sometimes we'd have events there and we'd go to roller gardens and we'd go roller skating. Well, a couple of months ago, we were watching this show called Songland. And if you've never seen it, it's basically American Idol for songwriters. And they bring in an, a, a guest artist, and then they have amateur songwriters basically pitch their original tune. And then the, the sort of celebrity artist picks their favorite and records it, and it becomes their single. Well, a couple of months ago, they had Will I Am from Black Eyed Peas, and he, they did this song called Be Nice. Now, we have got a kick out of this song because when we heard the original, we're like, that's the dumbest song I've ever heard. And then it's one of those songs that kind of sticks with you, and then you just find yourself singing it all the time, you know, those songs. And so it kind of became a joke at our family. Well, then Will I Am put out a music video, and it was him singing the song at a roller skating rink. And so then, while I was at work one day, my wife took all of our kids roller skating, requested Be Nice from Black Eyed Peas to be played by the DJ, and this was the video I received. Be different. So in case you haven't heard Be Nice from Will I Am and the Black Eyed Peas, there you go. It's basically just Be Nice, right? Uh, great song. 
Now, here's the thing about roller skating rinks. Uh, every once in a while, the DJ will call out if you've ever been roller skating. Now, how many of you went roller skating when you were a kid? How many of you have been roller skating this year? Yeah, much less hands. Yeah, clearly. Okay, so this is a huge thing when I was a kid. We'd go to the roller skating rink. We'd have birthday parties. Like all my friends in like first and second grade, this is like if you had a birthday party, you were going to the roller rink. And you'd go around, and then every once in a while, even as a teenager, we'd go there, and the DJ would call out, couples skate, right? And then you'd be like, okay, they'd play some sappy love song, and people would be holding hands, going around, and the disco ball's going. And then, uh, then he'd call out, uh, this one's for the ladies, you know? And then all the guys would have to get off the rink. And, and then, do you remember what he would call out when it was time for everybody to join after a couple skate, after a uh, ladies only, whatever it was, the DJ would call out, anybody? All skate, right? You're like, yes, I get to get back on the roller skating rink, because this is an all skate. Following Jesus is an all skate. So it's open to everybody, and that's, here's why that's so critical to our mission. That creates a couple of dynamics for us as a church. As we've kind of uh, declared all skate for everybody to follow Jesus, uh, what's happened is that we continue to see people walk through our doors. And that creates a dynamic that we have to be aware of. And here's what it is. Westbridge Church must always grow larger and smaller at the same time. Larger and smaller at the same time. Now, here's why I say larger and smaller. As a church, we absolutely have to keep growing larger. Why? Not because we set out to be a large church. That was never the goal. We were, in fact, we're way past anything I ever dreamed of 13 years ago. But the need drives the function. Our need to keep growing is driven uh, by the function of what we're doing. So as long as there are people who have not experienced the love and grace of Jesus, then we'll continue to make room for them here at Westbridge, and we'll continue to invite people. Now, that's why we need to keep growing larger. We never set out to be a large church, but we just know following Jesus is an all skate. And as we continue to invite people, and we want to make sure there's room for everybody that we're inviting. So that's why we're adding another service next weekend so that we can create more opportunities to invite even more people and more friends and neighbors and coworkers and family members to participate. In fact, this week, a whole lot of you, maybe most of us, got a mailer that we sent out. We sent out just under 70,000 of these, and it's an eight and a half by 11, pops out in the mail, and we're just saying, hey, we're going to be talking about relationships for the next four weeks. Even if you've never been to church before, just come and check it out. What have you got to lose? And we sent out almost 70,000. That's not people, that's addresses, homes that we sent that to. And so there's a whole lot of people coming to check out Westbridge in the next several weeks. And as we point people to Jesus, the church gets larger. Now, that's not the goal. The goal isn't to be a large church. The goal is simply to help people find and follow Jesus. But as we do that, more people show up. And sometimes I hear people say, well, I don't really like large churches. And then I just tell them, well, you're not going to like Westbridge then. Or heaven. <laughs> because <laughs> it's going to be big. Uh, <laughs> now listen, it's not because we set out to be a large church. It's just that we don't turn anybody away. And so uh, because of that, it, it was never the goal to say let's be a big church. But the goal is let's reach as many people as possible. And so the need drives the function. But as a church grows larger, uh, we recognize it can be easy to get lost in the crowd. And we don't want that to happen. In fact, we can't let that happen. So we have to grow smaller even as we grow larger. And so as a result of that, we have these two gatherings. Now, if you're new to Westbridge, maybe new over the last few months, we've got two gatherings. And, and we have our large group gatherings here on Sunday. And then we have smaller gatherings all over the area that we simply call groups. And these are groups of people, about 10 to 15 people, who gather together to share their lives. They talk about how they can take the things that we're uh, you know, talking about and discussing here as a church community, and how can I apply that to my specific context. But guess what? That's not our idea. As a matter of fact, this is how the church has always been conducted. In Acts chapter 2, this is actually uh, Luke who uh, traveled with many of the eyewitnesses and was friends with many of the eyewitnesses who, who uh, saw Jesus after he rose from the dead. And Luke kind of catalogs the church in the book of Acts, and here's what he writes. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, and they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. 
Now, you don't have to dig too deep into this to realize God is blessing what's happening, and there's a couple of things going on here. First, they're meeting in the temple courts, and then they're meeting in their homes. As a matter of fact, a couple of chapters later, uh, Luke writes that they, they met in the temple courts and they met house to house. The temple courts, the, the synagogue, the temple, that's where they met in a large group gathering. That's what we do here on Sundays. And then they met house to house. They met in, in homes and they met in smaller groups. That's what we do in groups all over the area throughout the week. Now, following Jesus only happens in the context of community. Think about this. The more closely you follow Jesus, the more in deep, deeply entrenched in community you become. It's impossible to follow Jesus in isolation because so many of the commands of Jesus are about how we interact with one another. So they're meeting in the temple courts. They're meeting house to house. And as a result, Luke tells us God is adding daily to their number, that they're actually growing numerically, but as they're growing, they're also staying connected in smaller groups. Now, here's the dynamic of the church that we need to understand. So if you got your outline, you can follow along. There's three arrows on there. One, it says from left to right on your outline, man, as we grow, as we grow numerically, here's what happens. And we started with groups, uh, yeah, community, and then we have also uh, just Sunday services. And here's what happens with a growing church. This is just a dynamic that we need to be aware of. When we first started, we started with uh, 12 of us in a living room. And so our, our church was a small group. So we didn't do small groups because we were a small group. And then we met in a movie theater. And what happens is this. We were probably running maybe 70 people, 75 people with kids and everybody. And we were meeting in the movie theater. And so there was probably 20 kids and, you know, 50 adults. And as a result of that, community is very high in a group that size. When you're meeting every week, uh, you know, it's like, well, we had two small groups at that time, right? So you're in one or the other. And, and so everybody kind of knew everybody. We did one service. And, and so community was very high in those days. But our ability to actually do a Sunday service well was very low. In fact, I had been a youth pastor for 10 years. So I had to figure out, how do I talk to grown-ups? Like, those first three years, like, I feel so bad for the people that attended our services. As I tried to figure out how to talk to grown-ups and, you know, like, say dude only like four times during a service, you know? <laughs> and so, like, as we were figuring that out, what happened is people were getting connected in community. So the community level was high, but our ability to do Sunday services really well was kind of like not great. And then more people started coming, and they felt connected. So the community was high. And then when we got to the point where, hey, I think we changed this and we changed that, and Sunday service is actually somewhat bearable. And so people were like, oh, that was kind of surprising. Like, that didn't suck. <laughs> and, and so it was kind of like, okay, I expect there to be community because there's not that many people here, but it actually surprised me how much it didn't suck. That's really cool. And then as we grew, more people started coming. We added a second service. And then the community part of it, this just naturally happens as more and more people naturally starts to go down a little bit. But our ability to pull off Sunday service as well increased because we had more resources, we had more people, we had more musicians, more tech people. We were able to do things that we weren't able to do before. But we also have to recognize as we grow, as we add a third service, now people go, oh, I kind of expected it not to suck. But it actually surprises me when I can get connected in community. The dynamic flips. And so that's something that we are really, really aware of as a church, that we want to keep growing. We want to keep inviting people. We never want to shut the doors and go, okay, it's enough. We've, we've read, like put a turner on the door, right, and count people as they come. Okay, we're full. We'll never do that. But as a result of that, we recognize sometimes the dynamic flips. And now what happens is, hey, service is great. How do I get connected? Hey, I really love Sunday mornings. But I, how, do I, how do I get connected in community? And so we recognize that's something that is a huge focus for us. And then here's what happens with churches all the time. And you may not be aware of this, but in a church that has really high community but isn't very good at putting on the Sunday service, they'll hide behind the community. they go, yeah, but everybody's connected. So we can just keep sucking at Sunday morning services. Or as churches grow, they go, yeah, people aren't really that connected, but look what we're doing on Sundays. Isn't it great? 
And so we don't want to hide behind one or the other. We want to go, how do we continue to grow larger and smaller at the same time? So we have to be really intentional about that, creating specific environments for people to connect relationally. Otherwise, all we end up with is a great show on Sunday mornings, but not an actual community. And when you drift from people of faith, you drift from faith. Think about this. If you feel isolated from the body of Christ, eventually you start to feel isolated from Jesus. See, this is why some of you maybe left the church at one point, or maybe some of you are coming back after being away for a long time. You slowly got isolated from the body of Christ, and you thought, well, I, I can continue to believe. I can continue to believe in Jesus. I can continue to follow Jesus, even if I'm not engaged in the community. And then over time, what happened? Your belief started to wane. Not that you don't have a mental assent, but your participation in your relationship with God started to drift. And there's no logical explanation for it except for this. When you drift from people of faith, you drift from faith. It's natural. Faith comes alive in community. So who is in your life who knows you, who's instilling courage to live out what you believe? Is there a setting for that? Do you have relationships like that? Is there context for that? Does anyone have that kind of access to you? Now, here's what's critical for you to understand when it comes to this value of community. You don't have to know everybody, but you do have to know somebody. You don't have to know everybody. In fact, you're not going to know everybody. As we continue to grow and we continue to invite more and more people, you're not going to know everybody. But it's critical that you know somebody, that somebody knows you and that you know somebody, and that you know somebody who's moving in the same direction you are spiritually. And making sure that we have environments where you can connect doesn't mean you have to be the most extroverted, over-the-top, outgoing personality. It just means you need to find someone who's a part of your faith community who's moving in the same direction you are spiritually. In fact, King Solomon wrote about this dynamic in his journal in Ecclesiastes. He writes this, Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. The idea here, the metaphor that King Solomon is tapping into, is that it's like you're on a journey, and as you're traveling this journey, if you fall and no one's with you, you're stuck. If you're out on a cold night and no one's with you, you'll freeze. If you get attacked and no one's with you, you can't defend your back. But if you're traveling this journey of life and you're doing it together with others, then if you fall, someone can help you out. Uh, if you're left out stranded cold on a cold night, you can spoon. Uh, that's basically what he says. Keep each other warm. Snuggle, however you want to say it. And then if you get attacked... You can stand back to back. You can defend each other. But what happens if you're alone? He says, life and faith are not meant to be lived alone. But having a couple of others with you provides support, provides encouragement, accountability. It reinforces your faith and your life. I'll tell you, I've experienced this firsthand in my own life. I'm privileged to be a part of a network of pastors from around the country. And these are guys, uh, some of who you have seen here this summer, who came and spoke here at Westbridge. And several of these guys are some of my closest friends and confidants that I've known for more than 25 years, who I've had a relationship with since I was 15 years old and 16 years old and 17 years old. Tom Elmore was my first youth pastor when I was 14. And Tom uh, started a church in Austin, Texas several years ago. Not Austin, uh, Houston. And, uh, and I'm like, man, this is so awesome that we're still connected, uh, you know, 25 years later that we are still connected with each other. Dave Nelson was here and has spoken a couple times for us this year. He was my youth pastor when I was 15 years old. And then we actually ended up on staff at a church together where we worked side by side. I traveled when I was 15 and 16 with him and James Grogan, who you've seen speak here. Uh, I met Skylar when I was 17. Skylar spoke here a few weeks ago, and we've been friends for more than 20 years. On top of that, I'm a part of a group here at Westbridge. And uh, when we get together, we laugh and we share life and we encourage each other. We pray for each other. We know what's going on in each other's lives and we encourage each other and support each other. Now you might be thinking, okay, that's great for you, but I haven't found my people yet. 
I got to find that right fit. Well, here's the myth of community, okay? Let me just blow your mind. Here it is. Community is something you have to find. Can I tell you something? That's such a huge myth. That community simply needs to be discovered. This is one of the biggest relational myths perpetuated in our society. As if genuine and authentic community is something that's just waiting to be discovered and you have to find the right fit. And the thought behind this goes like this. As long as you find the right person, join the right group, get the right job, or become involved in the right church, then it will work out. That's why so many people go from relationship to relationship, from job to job, from city to city, from church to church, looking for that thing that's the perfect fit for them. The idea is that, okay, real community, it exists out there somewhere, and we just need to tap into it. It's not something you have to work at. In fact, if you have to work at it, that's how you know it's not real community. This thinking runs so deep that people carry this into all aspects of life. If you have to work at your relationship in marriage, then you just must not be right for each other. Uh, if, if you have to work at community where you're employed, you must have a, just a bad boss or bad coworkers, right? If you have to work at community in your neighborhood, you just picked the wrong subdivision. If you have to work at community with people at church, then there are obviously problems with the church or its leadership or its systems because genuine and authentic community comes naturally, right? Genuine connection should just be that chemistry, right? Let me tell you about my first date with Cherry. I pulled up in my parents' minivan, very suave. We went to Fuddruckers, where she told me how much she loved the soda there because of how carbonated it was. Then we went uh, to buy gum and ice cream. We stopped off at Blockbuster. Like, what is that? Uh, it's where you rent these cartridges and you put them in this machine. You'll, you'll, you'll see. Uh, and we, so we rented a movie. We went back to her parents' house and rented a movie. And then I got pulled over. It was very awkward. And while we were purchasing gum and ice cream, she said, I hope our kids have your eyes. First date. It was a little awkward. There was nothing natural or easy about it. Community isn't effortless. Relationships aren't effortless. Community isn't natural. See, here's the truth when it comes to community. The truth is this. Community is something you build. Community is something that you forge. It's something that you cultivate. Community isn't something you find. It's something you build. What you long for isn't about finding the right mate, finding the right job, the right neighborhood, the right city, the right church. It's about making your marriage, your workplace, your neighborhood, your church, everything God intended it to be. Making it the community God intended it to be. Community isn't something that's simply discovered. It's something that is forged. It takes effort. It takes work. It takes time, just like any other relationship. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote so much about how to interact with other people. In his letter to followers of Jesus in Ephesus, Paul writes this, Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Well, why would he even write that? I mean, shouldn't just authentic community just happen and blossom? He says, no, no, no. You actually have to make allowance for each other because all of us are broken. He goes, make every effort to keep, uh, to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there's one body and one Spirit, just as you've been called the one glorious hope for the future. Make every effort, he says. Well, Paul, shouldn't this just come naturally? I mean, if I find the right people, if I find the right group, find the right church, so, right? Then if, if I didn't find the right one, then I just move on and find the next one, right? If I didn't find the right group, if I didn't find the right... Paul goes, no, no, no. There's already something that unites you. You already have something in common. It's the peace that comes from God's Spirit. It's the peace that comes from understanding that just as I've received God's grace, you've received God's grace. It's the one thing that unites all of us. So Paul says, look, you have that in common, so make that your common ground and maintain relationship around that. Now, the rest of it, you're going to have to make an effort. 
You're going to have to make allowance for each other's faults. That's going to require you to be humble and gentle and patient. Paul doesn't say, find the people you naturally click with and share life with them. He says, you have this one thing in common. God's Spirit has brought peace to you through Jesus. Yeah, but they're really different than me. I mean, we really don't have anything in common. Shouldn't I try to discover community with people that I really click with? Paul goes, no, the biggest thing you have in common is peace because of God's Spirit. Make every effort to keep yourselves united around that idea because when you do, that's when you experience true community. And guess what? When you do that, it's messy. That's why Paul says, make allowance, be patient, be humble. When I think about some of the friends that I've made at this church, I would have never had the opportunity to meet these people. But because God has marked my heart and because God has marked their heart, we have an automatic connection. Even if we have nothing in common because we recognize we are sinners who've been saved by the grace of God. Now, here's the deal. You get into community with people, and sometimes you get this romanticized idea about what community really is. So you show up to a group here at Westbridge, and it's difficult. And there's somebody there who's way too chipper. You're like, wow, you're bubbly. Good for you. And then there's someone who's like Mr. TMI, right? And you're like, whoa, we just met. That's a keeper to yourselfer, okay? Like, whoo. Somebody else rubs you the wrong way, and somebody else, you don't like their politics, and somebody else, you don't like their theology, and somebody else, you know, you don't like how they talk about their faith, or they talk too much, or they never talk, or they're too sensitive. Here's the deal. Jesus' community doesn't mean you get to be with people who are easy to be with. It means you get to be with people who have been forgiven by Jesus, just like you have. And together, you're helping each other learn how to love the way that Jesus loved. See, if our community is simply based on agreement in all things and chemistry in all things, that is a fragile friendship. But when our community, our connection is based on something so deep that I recognize I've been able to experience the grace of Jesus in my life and you've experienced the grace of Jesus in your life, that connects us. Now we simply have patience and make every effort to maintain the peace that comes from that, in spite of all of our differences. See, true community is not something that's discovered, it's something that's built. So if that's true, then how do I do it? How do I build community? Well, let me give you four simple steps to build community here at Westbridge. So number one, sign up. I know that's really oversimplistic. Here at Westbridge, Troop, at Westbridge Church, groups are the best vehicle that we have to help people connect. It's not the only way to help people connect, but it's a very intentional way for you to take a step toward connecting with people in community who are moving in the same direction you are spiritually. Now, you might say this, well, I have a group of guys that I meet with before work once a week. We've been doing it for 20 years. Awesome. We love that. That's great. Community is the value. 99.999% of us don't have that. And so what we need is a structure that we can just jump into, a system that we can jump into that helps us move towards connection and community with other people. So that's why we do groups, because it gives you a platform to connect. But if you're going to join a group, then first you have to join a group. So you got to sign up. Good intentions won't get you into a group. Browsing the catalog won't get you into a group. You got to sign up. And in just a few weeks, we're going to be rolling out a whole new catalog of groups for the fall. Now, here's what's awesome about this. Over the next four Sundays, we're going to be talking about marriage and relationships. And then uh, during that series, in just a couple of weeks, a whole new online catalog of groups becomes available. We're going to launch it during our marriage series. Then right after our marriage series, we're heading into a, a series called Game Plan, which I love. It's going to be all football themed, and we're going to talk about it for eight weeks, and we're going to talk about, like, what is the game plan for your life? What does God want your life to look like? And so we're going to go through that, and it's a perfect opportunity to jump into a group with some other people and for eight weeks go, hey, we're, going to, we're talking about it on Sundays, and then we're going to, in a smaller context, look at how I can apply this to my life. Now, it's an incredible topic to share with a group of people for an eight to ten week period, but to do that, you got to sign up. Signups are coming out in just a few weeks. Also, 
Let me say this. Some of you are in a position to lead a group. Some of you are in a position to host a group. And I want to encourage you, it's really, really simple. We write all the questions. You're really a facilitator. And if you are relationally warm, you can lead a group. If you are relationally cold and people just don't like being around you, you can participate in a group. <laughs> all right. So sign up. Number two, show up. Show up. Again, it's not enough to sign up. You have to actually show up. Right? This is where the rubber meets the road. Signing, is, signing up is the easy part. Showing up takes effort. You might have to plan a sitter. You might have to make sure that you get home from work on time. You might have to actually record your favorite show on TV. And here's the thing. Anything that is worth doing is going to require effort. And you always put effort into those things that matter the most to you in your life. You just do. And so I would say make this a priority. Show up. Now, real quick, I, I, wanna, I want you to add up in your mind all of the things you did over the last 12 months when you said to yourself, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go exercise. And then you didn't exercise. And I want you to think about all those times, and I want you to add up all, in your mind all the things you did instead of exercising in the last 12 months. Now, add up all the things that you did. Now, what does that come out to? What did you achieve by not exercising? Nothing. Here's the deal. You have nothing to show for the hours that you spent not exercising. The same is true of community. If you add up all the things you do over the next however many months that you could have taken an hour or 90 minutes a week and committed to being in a group, and instead you take that same 90 minutes and do whatever it is that you do and browse Netflix or whatever, here's the reality. You'll have nothing to show for it. But in the time that it takes you, to actually search for that movie on Netflix, which, by the way, is longer than the movie itself, you can and will have something to show for it. You'll have people in your life who support you and care for you, who are instilling courage in you to act out what you believe. That's what following Jesus looks like. It's built. So you got to sign up, and then you got to show up. you got to make the effort. And then number three, be yourself. Be yourself. In his book, Life Together, Dietrich Bonhoeffer describes the freedom that comes with complete honesty before others. Here's what he writes. In confession, the breakthrough to community takes place. The mask you wear before men will do you no good before God. You do not have to go on lying to yourself and your brothers. You can dare to be a sinner. Folks, we have worked so hard at Westbridge Church. It's a part of our culture. It bleeds into everything that we do that we keep the shame level low so that you can be yourself. It doesn't mean you stay there, but it means that when you arrive, just be you. Because guess what? You're broken, I'm broken, the person next to you is way broken. We've all got stuff that we're working on, that we're dealing with. But if we can't be ourselves and actually admit that and own it, then what are we doing? We're just putting on a mask and we're walking in, and it's like, hi, hi, how, oh, good, how are y'all? Good, good, good. Then we go back, and we deal with the, the stuff. That's not community. So the goal is keep the shame level low. See, sometimes we just live in a world where we wear a mask. There's this uh, goofy story about a, a guy who's desperate for a job, and he sees an opening at the zoo. And so he goes, hey, I'm, I'll apply for the job as a zookeeper. And the guy says, well, it's not actually a zookeeper position. Uh, we, man, I don't know how to say this. Our gorilla died. We need to replace him. And so... The job is to wear the gorilla suit and pretend to be the gorilla until we can actually get, a, you know, a new gorilla. And the guy was desperate for work, so he's just like, all right, man, I'll take the job. So he's out there, and he's kind of, he goes, okay, it's time. Get out there. Puts on the gorilla suit. He's out there. He's kind of pretending to be a gorilla, and he's like swinging from tree branches. And people are getting into it. They're actually like, a crowd starts to gather, and he's like, oh, this is, kind of gets the performer bug, you know? And he starts getting even more wild with it and swinging from branches. And in his sort of gusto and enthusiasm, he actually swung over the wall into the lion cage. And the lion pounced on him in an instant. It was raw and scratching at him and clawing at him. And he's like, oh, this isn't worth it. And he starts screaming for help. And the lion goes, shut up, you idiot, or we'll both lose our jobs. Everybody in the zoo is wearing a mask, okay? 
Welcome to the zoo. Here's the deal. Everybody wears a mask. When you show up in one of these groups, what we're going to ask you to do is this. Would you dare to take off the mask? Would you dare to just be yourself? You just be you. Hey, I'm, I'm great. I'm doing great. I love it. Failure doesn't bother me. I got a happy mask. At church, I wear a holy mask. Building community, not discovering it, but building it means I have the courage to take off the mask. Be myself. And I'll be honest. When that happens, things get messy. And that's why we keep the shame level low. So that you can be yourself without fear. Number four, show grace. Sign up, show up, be yourself, and then show grace. Because guess what? Other people are going to be themselves. And the only way that honesty works is in a culture that is saturated with grace. This isn't something that the church Universal has always been great at, but it's something at Westbridge that we're committed to. Beginning with Jesus and continuing with his followers, we discover grace is the engine that drives the train. And then truth comes behind. And unfortunately, what often happens in churches or Christian circles is people feel the need to, to lead with truth, and they never get around to grace. A common phrase I heard growing up was, uh, you know, love the sinner, hate the sin. The problem with that phrase is we did such a great job hating the sin, we never got around to loving the sinner. And it comes across like this. Don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't go there, don't say that, right? Don't read that, don't be friends with those people, but we love you. It's not very believable. Love is this little caboose at the end of the truth train that we just clobbered someone with. I would respectfully submit as a faith community that we reverse that and that we lead with grace, and that grace is the engine driving the train. We love you, we care about you, we want you here. We're so glad you're here. You can be yourself, you can be honest, you can take off the mask. Okay, but what about my sin? Yeah, you should probably stop doing that. That might hurt you, but we love you. See, that is the message of the good news of Jesus. And folks, that leads to hope. And in a world that traffics in false hope and shallow hopes, well, everything will turn out okay. Everything happens for a reason, does it? I think we need hope that goes deeper than that. That's not the foundation of hope we find in the community of Jesus. Instead, the author of Hebrews writes this, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm God can be trusted to keep his promise. Okay, what is that promise? What's that hope? The promise is that one day all things will be as they should be. Maybe not in our lifetime, but for those of us who find hope in something deeper, it goes beyond our circumstances, and we find hope in the fact that one day, the promise of God is that one day all things will be as they should be. All things will be made new. All things will be restored. And so the author of Hebrews says, look, hold on to that hope. And continues, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good work. Let us not neglect meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near saying, look, hold on to that hope and continue meeting together regularly to encourage each other in that hope that comes from something deeper. See, there's another day coming when all things will be made right. Our hope is not in human circumstances. Our hope is not that she'll say yes or that the school board will accept me. It's not that the job offer will come through. It's not that the house will appreciate and will sell it more than we paid for it. Our hope is not in the 401k. Our hope is in the invitation of Jesus to be a part of his family. It's an all skate. Because the message of the Bible, cover to cover, back to back, is that God is creating a family, and he wants you to be a part of it. And whatever your past, God wants to help move you from where you're at and help you to uh, experience community in his family. But it isn't something you discover. It's something you cultivate. It's something that's forged. It's something you build. So will you participate in that? May we be the church where we sign up, we show up, we remove the mask, we be ourselves, and we show grace in that process. Now, here's what Paul wrote. Make every effort to maintain the unity that comes from the Spirit. We get that from Jesus. So you have a different background than me. I have a different background than you. We have different styles, different sense of humor, different personalities, uh, all kinds of things that are different, so many differences. The one thing that unites us, the one thing we find hope in, is in the love and grace of Jesus. And never is that more on display than through his sacrifice. 
So on your way in today, the way that we remember his sacrifice is through communion. And um, these are our astronaut communion. So just peel the first one away. There's a wafer, and then we'll peel the second one. And here's what Jesus said. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, his followers. And he said, this represents my body, which will be broken for you. And when you receive this, remember it. And then in the same way, he took the cup, and he passed, and he said, this represents my blood, which will be spilled for you. It's the new covenant. It's the new uh, agreement between God and humanity. No longer is it through some sacrificial system. Now, I'm the final sacrifice. Now you can connect to God, and God receives you. And so this is a reminder for us. For those of you who are followers of Jesus, it's a rich reminder of the sacrifice of Jesus. And think about this. this is, I, I think this is so telling that the word communion and the word community come from the same root. You can't... You, you can't experience the love and sacrifice and grace of Jesus through communion without doing it in community. There's something so powerful about that, that it's the one another's, that's how we live out our faith in Jesus. So you don't have to be a member here at Westbridge to participate in this. We have an open communion. You're free to receive this with us. It's not an elaborate ceremony. It's simply a way for those of us who exist in community with other followers of Jesus to remember his sacrifice. So... As we remember the broken body of Jesus and his love for us, let's receive the bread together. As we remember the spilled blood of Jesus and the new covenant and agreement between God and man, let's receive the cup together. If you're here today and you say, I've never made that decision to follow Jesus, I want you to know you're invited. And if you'd like to say yes to that, you can just agree with this simple prayer. Jesus, thank you so much for the love that you show through sacrifice. And thank you that it's the thing that unites us. So we ask that as we move forward, may we be people who intentionally build community that we work at it, that we put in the effort, that we are a group of people who, in spite of our differences and in spite of even our flaws and our, our brokenness, that we extend grace to one another. And in that, we find true hope and true community. And for those of us who are here who would say, God, I want to say yes to the invitation to follow you. Make me a part of your family. Adopt me, make me your son, make me your daughter, and help me to follow your way of living life as best as I know how from this moment on. God, we uh, commit our week to you. Thank you so much for loving us the way you do. We pray this in your name. Amen. Hey, guys, thanks for joining us for our vision series uh, here at Westbridge Church. Uh, if you found this content helpful, we want to encourage you. There are a number of links that you can click below, including uh, if you need prayer, we've got a link for that. Or if you'd like to give today, you can click the link below for that as well. You can also text 763-333-333. 2221, any dollar, dollar amount to get started. Uh, we want to say thanks so much again for joining us for this vision series here at Westbridge Church, and we want to invite you to join us in person when you get a chance right here on Frankfurt Parkway in St. Michael. Have a great week.